it's been amazing to sort of get to meet them because they're all like, like proper legends, yeah, you know, Billy Corgan, Brian Wilson, Courtney Love, David Orban, Dave Roll. It's quite a strong set. Like. Elton John, John's Cocker <laughs> Trip, isn't it? It's my great. Gosh. Um, but you've got to get their permission to put them in the book, even though the, sh the interviews have been out on air. Who was the hardest one? <laughs> Uh, Elton, Elton John held out a long time. It, Elton wanted to see that everyone else had said yes. <laughs> and eventually go, oh yeah, now I'm That would have been the last one to yeah. say. Yeah, Rico said no. <laughs> Did he? Rico said no. Peace and love, peace and love. Peace and love, not good. I'm certainly not signing the agreement for that. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> In fairness, I don't know if Rico's people got it. I think they sort of went, yeah, uh huh, mm -hmm. uh huh. Yep, definitely. Um, he's a fucking beetle, mate. He's a fucking beetle. Um, so yes, you've got to go back and get everybody's permission. So everyone, all the artists have got to read the interviews again. And if you're Dave Grohl, the list of priorities you've got on a daily basis are like, you know, being fucking Dave Grohl. Are we playing American Stadium, 120,000 yeah. people on Wednesday, or are we going to cut curtain off the top? Exactly. You know, you've got that. This document for me. Hey, you're hanging with your amazing sort of music friends. Playing the drums, you know, da, 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 da. family just and then down the bottom is read this manuscript that some scrote from <laughs> London <laughs> sent over. But we did it. We we got everybody to say yes. Yeah, it's really it's an incredible achievement, actually. Yeah. I mean, I was I've got a lot of questions. I, I, it, you know me. I mean, I'm a colossal piss-taking bastard. This is true. But I honestly, I've, 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 I've prepared more for this interview than I, I, I do for 85% of my actual interviews. I don't know why I bothered. Which, which, would, which would be odd, because, but that's not actually an, a, a, an impressive statistic because you don't actually prepare for the interviews you do anyway. <laughs> it's not true. It's not that much news is a lot. Fake news is the greatest. Because I, I just, I just think that it seems to be pointless though in the 90 minutes that I spent writing these questions because I had a better idea, which was we've got the contents page here. Yeah. I'm just going to go down and go, was he a dick or was he not a dick? <laughs> <laughs> was he or she a dick or okay. was he or she not a dick? Yeah. <laughs> They're not messing up. That's child. Well, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the <laughs> bell end or not bell end. <laughs> I think the bell end ratio was quite low because I got to choose who it was. So, yeah. So it's course, not yeah. like I was like, oh. You I probably would have left the. Okay, who are the balance that didn't make the book? <laughs> it's more... A couple, of, a couple of people wanted money, and we were like, no, there's no, there's a BBC it's book. BBC. There's no money in it. Um, it's more a case of whether I was a bellend in the interview, whether I either lost my shit because I was too nervous, or said something really stupid. All right, so let me stop you there then. Like, uh, and apologies again, because my interview technique is slipshod and all over the place. So I make that. I make, I'm sorry, but I make no apologies for that. Um, first of all, speaking of when you've messed things up, tell us a little bit about Michael Stein, because that he, obviously Michael. Michael is. We yeah. both interviewed Michael. <laughs> you had to say that, didn't you? Um, and um, I, I found him very agreeable. Um, quite a lot of meat out of that. Um, but you, it was a fantastic interview. It was like a portmanteau interview of two different ones. I think yeah. But when you first interviewed, tell us what happened. I fucked it up. I, this was, it, was, it was one of the first big interviews I'd ever done. Like, this is over 10 years ago. Uh, I was working at a different radio station. I was like, oh, do you want to go and interview Michael Stein? He's like, yeah. So it's like, you kind of get quite. It's a big star. A big star. And they were playing the House of Apollo. So I got ushered backstage to go and meet Michael. And there's this. Beautiful dressing room is in. It's probably incense involved. Incense involved, candles, right? and he's sort of there, perched on a, a tall chair like a sort of exotic bird. <laughs> so he, has a, he has an energy. He about does an energy him. about him. Uh, and I'm quite nervous. But we start and we're getting on quite well. I'm thinking, oh, this is all right. This is quite easy. Uh, he seems like a nice plan. And we're having. You know, and I mistake this kind of can, bon this bonhomie. But I just took it a bit far, so I'm, I'm, I'm asking him questions that maybe I shouldn't do, and I'm like thinking, oh, you know, his lyrics are quite famous. Because he didn't put his lyric sheets in early albums. You never knew what the fuck he was talking about. Bleak one. Yeah. So I was like, oh, you know, thinking this is going quite well. Oh, do you ever change your lyrics during a gig? You know, do you ever sing something different? People don't know what you're singing about anyway, do they, Michael? This one goes out to the one I dove. For. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you would get. You know, just kind of mess with people. And he was like, why would I do that? <laughs> what? This is my art. I can feel the room change. 
Like, I don't understand why you <laughs> do that. And what was that? Shat in his room. Oh, God. <laughs> and from that moment, it was like he just looked at me with this just pity of just like. Yeah, it was, it was not even anger. Not anger, which would have been right. Just like, you are just the fool. You're me. <laughs> you don't understand. Oh, God. That's the, I'm glad I got you to, to relive that. Yeah, that, that, that was pretty bad. This book's. Full of, of incidents and experiences. <laughs> Nothing like that, thank goodness. But let's get on to that. Before we get on to some of the people, what is, and forgive me because we do constantly brick about each other, but what, what is your interview take? Because, and alone me here, it's going it's to hurt to do this, but I'm going to be sincere. But you do, you've got a warmth, you've got a humour. You know, you've got a real journalistic eye. There's nothing to say about this. But you're on. <laughs> you know, there's veracity to what you do. It's not, you know, you just sort of blunder in half dressed, going, hey, what the fuck? What are you? Which is my turn. Yeah. <laughs> what, so, what, how do you, what, because I sometimes come to you for advice when, it, when there's a big person I've got to interview. What, how do you disarm? You've got to disarm the person, haven't you? Get them to, what, what, what's your technique? There's lots of little tiny things. There's little, there's techniques. Well, it's it's got to be a conversation, not an interview. That's one thing. Um, most musicians are actually pretty easygoing. Like you kind of forget, even your like most, you know, rock starry, exotic rock star. Probably before they got there, spent a long time in a transit van, you know, eating crisps with their mates, to, playing to no one. So they're pretty easygoing. They don't mind. Being, like, if you go and treat someone like they're a rock god, they'll act like one. Yeah, they used to, the, yeah because of that. They're used to a, the banter element as, yeah. as well. Like they used to have the piss take that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so just what does not belong to that. Long as it's not my style. In 1925. Um, and then try and shut up. Yeah. Let, let them do the work. Let them do the talking. That's enough of that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, it's like, you mentioned Michael Parkinson. It's like, ha, I don't remember Michael Parkinson asking any particularly long questions. Or any of those shows where it very much the Mike Parkinson. But it was all about just the little questions that result in those big long answers. Yeah. So shut up. I don't like those interviews with musicians when someone the question all bangs on about their own opinions. Who cares about me? Do you, you know any names there? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Buy me a drink. And that that's another thing about musicians, isn't it? It's just uh, and it, it genuinely is an extremely absorbing read. I started, you know, absent-mindedly leafing through it a couple of days ago. I was like, fucking hell. to do this. I found myself completely absorbed because I, I, I just love the, I love the rock and roll of you. But it's great to read people like Wayne Coyne, you know, like he's, just to, because he's one of my favourite sort of performers anyway, but he, he, he touches on the fact that most performers are actually uh, introverts, Introverted extroverts, aren't yeah, they? Exactly. What they really want to be doing is, what is, is, is to be left alone, but they, it's foisted upon them to go out there and become these peacocking and, and almost sometimes ridiculous people. Is that what you find? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a strange uh, dichotomy in music. It is, it is, look at me! No, no, don't, don't, don't yeah. look at me. But look at me! But don't. I don't want to speak to anyone. Please keep away from me, keep away from the artist, but I will go on stage in front of 20,000 people and demand your attention. There's that sort of insecurity there. I don't know, yeah, those, the kind of people that, that will do that, that want to do that, tend to often be quite insecure. I don't know whether they're overcompensating for something. Sometimes a bit damaged as well. Yeah, okay. Um, Wayne, um, <laughs> Wayne's, Wayne's, uh, I think the Wayne chapter's all about um, him talking about yoga, isn't it? You, don't, you just touch on yoga quite a lot. I mean, I can't see me too, I don't mind touch on. Yeah. You completely lost me. Do yoga, yoga, man, do yoga. I was like, oh, all right. No, really. You do, do yoga stretch. You'll live longer. That's Goldie, isn't it? You never, never interview Goldie. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> you never him out of the house. He, he actually said to me when he came, in, he came into Wargan House and we interviewed him, he's like, What are you doing after the show? <laughs> I said, I'm going to have a lie down, probably. Come to Yoga. I've got a big guy. I've got a big guy. I've got a big guy. I'll see you over there, mate, at 11. I'm all right. Thank you, no chance. <laughs> I'm referring to my actual uh, research here. Um, what uh, I've done that, do you think, right, which musician do you feel has been most quoted or referenced by other musicians you've interested, like, uh, that you've interviewed, like uh, as an influence maybe, or 
you know, the, the, who is the most referenced musician that you? That well, is it because we, we we've tried to do a sort of a reasonable spread of like people's backgrounds and genres and ages and, 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 and stuff, just because you kind of want to make it as varied as possible. Uh, a lot of the old rock and rollers all talk about Skiffle. Lonnie and Donegan. Like, Lonnie Donegan, yeah, which is kind of. And at first you're like, oh, he's going to go on about like that old stuff again, that old music. But then when you hear them talking about it, they're like, yeah, but before Skiffle and Elvis, there wasn't anything yeah. like that at all. There was no. It wasn't like you heard Elvis and went, oh, this just sounds like some American guy. You're like, what the fuck? Who? What is this? Is this a man? Is it a woman? Is he black? Is he white? Where the fuck is he from? It was a complete, it blew people's minds. And I think when the, those things happen in music, don't they, whether it's punk or rave or whatever. But I think when it happened first, in the UK at least, with Skiff and the very early rock and roll, it, it did change, yeah. it changed people's lives in a, in a quite remarkable way. Yeah, I'd say, I, I, I probably concur that Lonnie Donegan comes up. We had Roger Daltrey in just two weeks ago. Just before he mentioned Brexit on the health show on Five Live. <laughs> um, I suppose you'll be asking about Brexit, will you? No, I fucking won't be asking about Brexit. <laughs> An idiot. <laughs> John Humphrey, so not even about that Brexit. <laughs> but that but that again, he was he said exactly the same. I mean, it's actually I did, never knew this about Daltrey, because you don't Daltrey. He dubbed Townsend, dub Daltrey. Townsend's in the book. <laughs> Townsend's in the book. Um, but you know, they, 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 they do talk about it. Roger Daltrey used to make his own guitars. He used to make his own guitars. It's just ridiculous, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's, kind of of it's, it's this funny thing where like the, the history and music, a lot of those old stories kind of they feel quite happy and you, you think you know this stuff and you hear people whose lives it genuinely just altered. It does take on a new kind of uh, new kind of weight. No, what can I hear in the distance? That's <laughs> one of the youngest members of the Matador fan club. It is. And we have, I, don't, I want to say a little ripple of a, a tiny little murmur of appreciation for the, the, the little BB Everett, ladies and gentlemen. She is, she's actually hearing us. That's a lovely noise. Two weeks old, two weeks old. What a lovely noise that one. <laughs> a really polite smack on me. Don't care about the baby, by the way. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get back to BB and to, uh, to family life a, a bit later. Oh, maybe we won't. Uh, maybe we'll leave that to be a private thing. Um, let's let's ask about who 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 most intimidated you. There's some interviews that didn't make it in the book. Nick Cave scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is turning into like rather the good ones are in the book. Because um, I didn't do any research. So no, you got me, like, 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 we've, we've, all, all, we've all had those mornings when you're going to work, I'm not quite on top of this, but I'll be okay. We'll coast it, because I know what I'm doing, more or less. It's going to be okay. Eleven and a half years. Can't do that with Nick <laughs> Cannot do that with Nick Cave. You're sort of going, like, all of a sudden, he's, he's staring at you with those eyes. <laughs> and you're like, so, having not listened to the record, it was a Grindr Man record. So, um, if, if, Nick, if, maybe if, Someone hadn't heard the record. How would you describe it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic. Yeah, it's like an absolute. I did. I should have listened to the record, but I did. How would you describe it? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, they're going in many ways. It's a complex record. How is it complex? <laughs> yeah. Didn't make it the way it was. It was I, I, I've never interviewed him since. It was a shame because I fucking love him. He's amazing. Butterfly on a wheel. He had you yeah. friends, didn't he? That that was pretty intimidating. Prince. I mean, that was pretty nice. I don't think, not everybody would know the Prince story, because we, our old mate, Leanna Abbas, was involved, wasn't she? Yeah. Uh, Prince just happened to, to pop around to her flat in Homerton to do, a, a, you know, obviously, as one does. He popped around to mine, but I was out. <laughs> <laughs> we went over to Leanne's, and what happened then? Well, this, yeah, this was, he was announcing his, fun, his what, he was announcing his final time, his tour of the UK. Is that the Hit and Run tour? Hit and Run tour, and he announced it in Leanna Abbas' front, front room. With a press conference with me and two other journalists sat on their sofa like that. Yeah. And we get there, and there's like the house is surrounded by security. Even though it's like a terrorist house, there's like a front door, like a gate there, and a front door there. And there was two security on the gate, then two on the front door. <laughs> so we get there, and there's the lounge is set up like a stage, and there's all Prince's people there. Security guards, no sound prints. Well, you're in a draw like that. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes, man. <laughs> and I looked at me, they were like, this is about seven o'clock, and I'm like, oh, what time's Prince going to be? 
Prince will be here when Prince decides to get here. <laughs> uh, what, what's Prince going to be announcing? Prince will announce. What Prince will be announcing. Okay, how long have we got? The interview the, will be as long as, long as Prince I'm getting it. wants it to be like. Okay. Does Prince want a cup of tea? If Prince decides he wants a cup of tea. <laughs> And we waited, we waited like 7 o'clock, 10 to 8 o'clock, 10 to 9 o'clock, and then this big, this blacked out sort of van arrives outside, we can see it at the windows. And these sort of Amazonian women sort of step out, unfurl themselves, <laughs> headdresses and long black gowns. And they sort of walk into this terrace house in Wolfenstein. <laughs> this is Apollonia and Dionysia where the fire got. And they sort of drape themselves on the sofa. <laughs> and we waited for another couple of hours. Well, somebody else is like, we just waited. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, and then, kitchen door opens, and there's Prince. <laughs> Aki massive afro, black all in one outfit, big players, cup of herbal tea, cup of herbal tea. <laughs> big sofa. Oh, it's fucking Prince. And so I'm like, this is, this is an interview I've been waiting to do my whole career. This is amazing to even be in the room with him. As he sits down on, on quite a high stool, we're on a low sofa, we're on a high stool. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and I take out the microphone and he's like, no. He's got quite a low voice, actually. No. I was like, oh, I'm the guy from the BBC I'm doing the interview. He was like, no. What's going on? Radio, need to record it. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. <laughs> interview back, didn't have a notepad. Tissue, little Kleenex balls like that, pyro. Uh, trying to scribble down everything he says. Oh my god. Um, he smelled brilliant. Yeah, yeah. He smelled brilliant. <laughs> and I was pregnant. I shook his hand. Yeah, yeah. Twins. Yeah, right. <laughs> Twins. Like the, um, there's a really nice thing with this. Because uh, we're really lucky because of what we do. We, we know some of the people at Glastonbury. And they knew I was doing the interview and they phoned and go, oh, right, please. If you see Prince, if this interview does happen, ask him to do Glastonbury because we've got really close a few times, but it's really difficult to get to Prince. There's lots of management and stuff, and he lives in his own world. Mm -hmm. I was saying, sure, of course, I'll ask Prince. <laughs> so I asked Prince after the interview, oh, do you want to, you know, you're a broker of the deal. Right? <laughs> he thought about doing Glastonbury. He's like, what's that? Like, oh, it's a festival. Okay. It's good, you'd love it. There's no branding, it's, it's like a big charity thing. Oh, okay, really? You should do it. It's all purple and that. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it'd be like, bands do it. There's not a lot of money, but you don't do it for the money either, because it's a really incredible event. It's a really wonderful, magical place. Okay. And uh, a few weeks after the interview, I get a phone call from the Glassman people going, thanks very much, you obviously raised it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, because we got a phone call from Prince's people just after your interview. I was like, yeah. And they said, Prince's people phone and went, Prince, Prince would like to do Glassman. Okay. He'll do it in April. It doesn't. That's how there's Prince World and there's everything else. Yeah. Yeah. But then you can look at the thing we mentioned, we mentioned it there that, like, why not? It would just be great for him to just do it to the current. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and Michael just stand in there. <laughs> When Dubs cry next? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely fucking brilliant. Um, you know, I mean, it's the, the, the people in it. I mean, I, I should mention um, Brian Wilson. I'm just going to actually, oh, I hope Brian, you don't yeah. mind. I, you see now, you can see how organised that. You see, that's why I think this is my little okay. sheet paper in it. So professional. <laughs> is that what well, I don't know? Let you behind the velvet curtain of my process. Um, I knit. Is that bottom. tissue paper you're talking about? Actual tissue paper. <laughs> 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 it's not. Wait. <laughs> um, but just to mention Brian, because for obvious reasons, because Brian's a very sensitive human being who's, you know, who's to some degree been broken by the, the process, the, the things that he's been through. But I just. Uh, to read this little excerpt, Please, go for because it. it kind of moved me. Uh, every time I've interviewed Brian, he seems a little further away. It's like spotting a star in the sky that you're told is gone, but you can still see how it was a million of years in the past. The genius shines of Brian Wilson for so long and so powerful that everyone saw it. Eventually, he started to burn himself out and collapse. So what we see now is a shadow of what he was. But the light that's reaching us from all those years ago is so brilliant, we'll see him forever. 
Because I mean, he's, he's like, you know, it's just a man who. The music was just in his head, wasn't it? This is what he says. It's like he didn't have to think about music or compose music, it was just there. And he had to get it out. And then the weight of being him. And Dick loads the drugs. Uh, <laughs> it's like a half for a pint of acid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll just have a half tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the, which is, yeah, that makes, I, I think, yeah, but the. the the difficulty of just being Brian Wilson and being laboured with this, with this talent really, really broke him. And you do, you kind of meet him, and he's not really there. And then I think I, I say in the book, and like he'll, he'll be quite vacant, and you'll, the answers will be just very. And then he'll like come into focus for a bit, and you kind of have him, and he'll answer questions, and he'll be funny and self-deprecating, and remember stuff and tell stories about, you know, people phoning him up, and, you know. John Lennon just goes, Jesus Christ, you're a fucking genius. And then after about half an hour, he kind of, he fades off again. And then he suddenly, I've interviewed him a couple of times, he just stands up and just goes, thank you. <laughs> What's your name? And you go, I'm Matt. I'm Brian. And then he goes, he just literally stands up and walks out of the room. It's tragic, but he's, yeah. But at least he's got healthy boundaries, though. I wish I, I would, I'd like to learn to do that. Well, I just go, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm sorry, I'm absolutely done with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, but only someone like Brian Wilson can do it. Um, what about, is Bill Drummond the most cerebral man you have ever interviewed, present company accepted? <laughs> yes, nobody has the, the, uh, the mental uh, acuity, a, a, agility and acuity of you, no. clearly. I'm a bit like Ryan Wilson, actually. I get, I get about half an hour a day. A day? Or a week. <laughs> and then it's gone. But, so, but Bill Drummond, he's, he's a formidable yeah, so of intellect. Yeah, he's, he's in the book. It's yeah. a great interview. Bill's, um, Bill Drummond was obviously a member of... Uh, part of the sort of uh, Liverpool post-punk world and managed lots of bands, including Echo and Barneyman, and then formed the KLF, like great art, pop, provocateurs. And he's just incredibly bright, <laughs> enormously, like, staggeringly original thinker. And you just, you feel quite, quite sort of stupid when you ask the question, like, <laughs> So, tell me about the first time you owned a piece of music. He's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's he's cool. like, I, you don't own music. Every time you hear music, you own it. So your question doesn't make any sense. He says that then he follows up with something really withering, doesn't he? I suppose what you're actually trying to say is like, what's the first record that I bought? Yeah. 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 That would be. Yeah. Well, he he um he was very very involved in going through his chapter to make sure it was right. Because his thing was like, look, my opinions change in my life all the time. I think different things about things that, as we all do, really. You know, so it was to go back into uh, this, yes, I still feel this way about the things I said. And then, because there's a playlist, this is a, also bug, so yeah, one of the cool things about the book is there's a playlist for every single chapter. So all the music chosen by the artist or mentioned in the interview is in a playlist. And if you get your phone and you've got Spotify, you scan it. That's really cool. And yeah. then you get the playlist. <laughs> <laughs> you've got an audible gasp at the back. From a 74 year old, you have to play it. <laughs> And you've, got their, and, you've got, and you've got their songs, but um, Bill's, let me find Bill's, because Bill, Bill didn't want to do a playlist, because he was like, no. what, is this, what did he say? I would not describe these as my all-time favourite tracks, but what they are, pieces of music that had an influence on my life, some of them that still resonate down the years. I've never been one for mixtapes. Most of the pieces of music on this list I've not heard for years, and I've no problem if I never hear them again. <laughs> Truth is, I rarely listen to music other than that music in my head, which is there all the time. <laughs> so his playlist is actually a song a year. Uh, he, he chose a song for every year that he's been alive. Oh, that means something to me. He's so conceptual. I know. <laughs> I know. So Very similar to the Fratellis. Very much like the Fratelli. <laughs> they become such a break. Uh, <laughs> this is going well. Is this all right? He was quite nervous before. Well, shit breaks, actually. You can't do this stuff anymore. We so haven't seen each other for ages. I know. Because normally every single morning <laughs> at six o'clock. Like a jackboot in the face of humanity face. <laughs> Your face, my face. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks into the studio and then we have uh, an eight minute fucking moan. <laughs> At the BBC, yeah. Who's the biggest bell end you've seen in the last 24 hours? Yeah. Anyway, um, so we'll come back. that's a good question. Yeah. Me! I'm going to 
Which bell have you spoken to? What time is it? It's half past I've got another ten minutes before I'm going to throw it on to everybody else. Um, other questions include, do you ever think, ooh, I'm glad I'm getting this on record before he or she carks it. <laughs> Be honest. It's a tough question, isn't it? Be honest. And what, you know... Yeah. I think I've yeah. done that. I mean, the, the, I guess the slightly less awful version of that is when you're speaking to someone who's quite old, then who you admire, then it's like, I'm getting a chance to do it. The Wilco Johnson one, that was insane. Well, the, can I just yeah. say that as well? Because that's one of the most profound bits, really. And, and, and actually, I've you seen that's the other piece of tissue. <laughs> that one is staying. It's sticking to the face. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's just a, just a sneeze, I promise. <laughs> Touch for your autobiography. It's just a speech, I promise. No, it's not. It's, uh, but remember, it's two volumes. Folding it in and thumbing it in. It's not about me. Um, and can I again? I mean, is it, uh, can I read this? Yes, yeah, uh, Well, I mean, I'm going to say that. All right, yeah. Uh, but he says that because the. Just to contextualise, this is the, the, one of the interviews that he did where he definitely thought he was dying. Yeah, and he just didn't have very long at all at this point. Just been announced that Wilco had got uh, terminal cancer and had decided to forego chemotherapy and radiotherapy and just let it run its course. And so I went to go and interview him, thinking that, well, as far as we knew... This was a kind of last will and testament moment. Yeah, really, this, was, this is like this recording a man's thoughts. But yeah. this is something that we've talked about before, uh, how there's not enough of this done, you know, uh, find, find out what people actually think just before they die. Yeah. And so this, just a little excerpt from that, uh, Matt, Matt asks, how does the world look to you now? And he says, it looks pretty damn good, and he laughs. I tell you, man, you're walking down the street and you just, it's intense. There are branches standing against the sky, gesturing in the full of life. It's life, you know. I think of all the years I've spent wallowing in misery and hung up by the most stupid things and people and events and God knows what. I know I can see that it doesn't matter, it just doesn't matter. When the sickness starts, perhaps I won't be so sure of it. Man flu's about as far as my tolerance goes, so I probably won't be happy when I get sick. But right now I'm not sick, I feel fine, and everything looks fine. I should have realised this years ago. I remember you playing that out. Yeah. Uh, and just, everybody's doors were completely well, locked off. Yeah. And he's, he was, he was saying, because he's a really lovely guy, he's kind of sort of angry man for a long time. That was kind of part of his persona. And then you got this, and I was in this interview, I'm, I'm asking, you know, so, is that, you've, had, you've had a life in music, Will Cut, that's a really brilliant thing. He said, yeah, he said, because his wife died of cancer about five years previous. He said that for 15, 20 years, come on, he was married, to, he said, for 15 or 20 years, I was married to the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, I played music my whole life, and a week ago, my grandson came and took his first steps, just over there, in the lounge, to ask for anything more from life would be greedy. Mm. Jesus. And he made it, and he's fine. And there's, yes. it's not, there's a bit of the interview when I went back to go and speak to him afterwards. And he was um, back to being quite curmudgeonly, which I like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, bollocks to that. Yeah, it's it's uh, Candy Island's finest, isn't it? What, um, what do you do with the millions the BBC pays you for your episodes? Is it property or bonds or yachts? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot of yachts. 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 Yeah. Big times then. He's big into yachts. Do you? Do you and Pete sort of pull up together yeah. in Antigua? Flying yachts. Flying yachts. Fly, flying underwater yachts. A lot of them. Yeah. Do they have those? Yeah. So that's that. Um, <laughs> Rod Stewart is in the book. My backing vocalist. <laughs> do you know about everybody this? Everybody knows about this. Oh God, it's nearly fucking Christmas as well, isn't it? <laughs> Sean did a Christmas song. Sean really. You've got to tell me. <laughs> Do you know about this? Rod Stewart's a backing person. And he genuinely <laughs> believes that at this song still stands a chance yeah, to make three million. You do actually believe. I'm not kidding, it's a sleeper hit. No. <laughs> Except I did take it to a publisher and they said, I, I really like the song. It's just a bit unfortunate that it's called All I Want for Christmas is You, which is exactly the same title as one of the biggest Christmas hits of all time. That's a twat. <laughs> But um, not, men not one mention of me in the interview. In your, no, you get mentioned, I think you mentioned it, I think you mentioned it in the back. The okay. acknowledgements. Um, what, um, let's ask, you, ones that have eluded you, are there people that you, you, you uh, would right. love to but you haven't, dead or alive, you know, what, 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 what um, is on that list? 
I I didn't interview David Bowie. He walked past me. He did. He's never even walked past me. About that far. Where were you? Uh, you were Aldo. Aldo. <laughs> <laughs> Remember this story? Well, where was that it? was at XFM radio station. Now oh, Radio X. Chris Moyles is Radio X. <laughs> um, it's an excellent program. You really should check it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, sort of, he uh, I, 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 I would have found that quite difficult because you my love for him is so is so overwhelming. <coughs> I don't think I would have been able to have done anything because he would have wanted to talk about. Kandinsky and like, you know, futurism. And you would have been talking about Go on, <laughs> go on. You would have been stitched like a kipper, like uh, Paxman was 25 years ago. Is it 1999? It's on YouTube. There's an interview that Paxman does with David Bowie, and David's sitting there looking good, unbelievable, like another worldly human, not even a human, almost like a sort of android with his eye. And looks incredible. And it's all you can do to not jump and mount the television. <laughs> And just looking like a fat twat in a suit, <laughs> being really sort of smug. And, he's, and, and, and David's talking, David, he's talking <laughs> about the internet. And, uh, so, what's the future for your music and records and CDs? Is there won't be any CDs or records, it'll all be on the internet, it'll come straight into your house, people won't be paying for music. And Paxman's just like, he, he can't compute it. He's like, that sounds ridiculous to me. <laughs> But it, yeah, he, just, he, just, he was just right. always so far ahead of yeah. everybody, wasn't he? But he was right. Um, I, I mean, every time I interview Macca, I always, I always, it makes me enormously happy. You, I had the first time with him. So that's, that could be volume two, couldn't it? Because yeah. you get some, you get really good stuff out of Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason I said that. <laughs> I, I, I interviewed him in 2008, it was a shite interview. I got, I got eight and a half minutes with him, and it was so bad that uh, I said yeah, uh, 76 times, eight minutes, and it was so funny that we edited all the years together, and then at the end we just went, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was like the, well you get, you get really nice, you get getting quite chatty, don't you? Yeah, yeah, Why do you do that? <laughs> it's no. With someone like that, I mean, he's, he's like changed the world. He utterly changed the world, you know, he's, he's, he's the most, he's also really fucking cool, Macca. Uh, we went to go and interview him, didn't we? And he was, he was like, I don't know, this, you sort of forget with the great, sorry, they, <laughs> it's easy to get the image of the like, Perma happy, you know, seemingly eager to flee <laughs> guy there. But he's amazingly cool. He's really laid back, really funny. He's got an edge to him. He's got an edge to him, yeah. He's, he's, he's got, I'd love to get first time in. I was supposed to do all with Bruce Springsteen, but I ended up getting an eight minute interview with him, which wasn't long enough. No. Never done Bob Dylan. He's, uh, he's Patty he's Smith. I want to get Patty Smith. Uh, I really want to get her for the book. She gives the same. She said, no, can't be asked. I don't know about the company ass bit, but she does say no. Chaka uh, Khan I want as well, hopefully for the next series. Although she, she keeps saying no as well. She keeps saying no so much that the production team has started to call her Chaka Khan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it. Okay, so that's a good list. Um, when was the first time that you had hummus? <laughs> well, I was 24. I had uh, hummus in the... Relic Tower oh, in West London uh, with Nathan McGough, the oh, manager of the Happy Mondays, oh, and son of uh, Roger McGough, the Liverpool beat poet, in 2000, and he, which is quite late. That is late. later than me. And he whips them out, <laughs> the hummus. Chopped it, chopped it out, did he? In lines. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> squeezed a bit of lime over it, which blew my fucking mind. <laughs> then got the Doritos out. I was like, okay, I'm safe with the Doritos, I'm okay with this bit. No matter how weird this yeah. chip he is, yeah. you know, it was quite high in the trade town. It's quite, you know, <laughs> bohemian. Scooped it. Have a look back. <laughs> you know, that's quite. That's quite a recent. That's a good question. That is good, isn't it? I think I might start incorporating this into all my interviews. is Lawrence King. There's a book in this. Yeah. The so, first time you the had hummus. hummus. It's, a <laughs> time. It's, it's a little. It's a short one. Um, lost your virginity or not? Uh, have you ever tried to tot up how many musicians? Interviews you conducted, the sort of ballpark figure. I mean, you've done, yeah. Well, there's, we've done 150 first time interviews, and I think about 120 of those have gone out. But as for the other ones, because we did like about two, three a day, 
I've been doing that since 50, 16. We've been doing this for 12 fucking years. Well, we've been doing it at the BBC for 12 years, and then six years before that, when we were at the same station. We could work it out if we were mathematics. Or <laughs> if anybody was interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's slow down it, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But all the best things I did. I did the James Brown interview. That was that was a weird. Not one. James Brown, the ex-editor of Loaded, by the way. No, <laughs> the actual James Brown. That was. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? <laughs> it, was a, it was a phone interview. So you get a phone call. Um, it's supposed to be at six o'clock or something like that. And you get a phone call at five, going, uh, right? These are, this is what you need to know. It's Mr. Brown. You refer to him as Mr. Brown, and Mr. Brown's assistant will be calling you at seven o'clock. So I thought it was six, but fine. So you wait till seven. Another phone call, Mr. Brown, I will be calling you at half past seven, so you wait. Half seven. Mr. Brown, his manager will be calling you at the o'clock, so you're waiting there by this fucking phone. And then James Brown's manager comes on the phone, who's called Super Frank. <laughs> James Brown's manager is called Super Frank. <laughs> fucking perfect. Uh, Mr. Brown will be calling you in an hour's time at 10 o'clock. So you wait there, and the phone rings. Thanks, James Brown. And you can't understand the fucking way. <laughs> and it's recording, and it's like, you've got your questions ready. So you're like, okay, so Mr. Brown, it's amazing you're coming out to the UK. It's a man! The only thing I could work out from his speech was, uh, he'd occasionally say, it's all good. So you'd hear, it's a man! It's all good! So, uh, it's been a few years since the last recording, so it'd be lovely to hear you. Getting back in the studio again. It's all good. <laughs> and this goes on. I'm thinking, well, this is brilliant. But I don't know what he's saying. And I had a question. It was about the time that Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson was alive, and he'd gotten various allegations floating around him. And I know that Michael, James, Mr. Brown, fuck, had been friends. We're friends. So I remember saying to him, "Oh, have you have you spoken to Michael about these allegations?" It's bad. It's <laughs> bad. The interview. I, I think we played it out. That. It didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. James Brown fact. There's two good James Brown facts. One is that he died on Christmas Day. Uh, how many years ago it was? But because I kind of got to know the management a bit, he didn't die on Christmas Day at all. He died a couple of days before then. But the management were like, we're not going to say that. Put him on ice. That's not a Mr. Brown thing. <laughs> <laughs> he would be. He would, he would prefer to be died on Christmas Day. So they delayed the announcement of Christmas Day. The other thing, when he died, this is true, uh, no one had any idea how old he was, because when he was born, yeah. he was so impoverished. Like Jerry Halliwell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have any record of his birth. There was no documentation of James Brown being born. Mr. Brown. It was a brown Christmas that year. <laughs> it was. I had a few of them myself. It's all good. And of course, there's a third fact there about James Brown, which is the old reason that he became the, uh, the soul fun legend that he, be, that he eventually uh, came to be known as because he got sacked as a, a train announcer at New Cross Station. Oh. <laughs> so people couldn't really understand where he was talking about. He also, um, James Brown was very on like old school, the old school entertainer, and uh, would still would insist on being paid in cash for every gig, every gig he ever did. No invoicing for Mr. Brown, no fucking way. He would, you'd have to give him cash before he went on. I remember being at a gig, a festival, Europe somewhere, knowing he was playing, and waiting backstage for his, like, to, to watch him arrive. Do you want to see James Brown walk up stage? Uh, and his band were on. His band were playing for about half an hour. No fucking sign of James Brown. He's coming! It's all good! No sign of James Brown. And then this, I fucking kid you, it's like a grassy backstage festival area. And this white limo pulls up, the front of it nudging the sort of tent. Window goes down, someone comes out of an office. Bag. Oh, my. Into the window. Window goes up again. A couple of seconds. Okay, door open. Oh, <laughs> that is how you do it. Why did we negotiate that when we started the beam? You know those little, pound, those little bags of pound coins? Yeah, is that what we get paid? Yeah, we get like, <laughs> no friend of the IRS, was it? <laughs> Absolutely staggering. Um, it reminds me of the time when me and Caris Matthews uh, got to interview B.B. King 
at Glastonbury in 2011, and uh, we got ushered to his uh, win to his coach, and fucking BB King, and we had nine minutes with him, of which we spent five trying to find the remote control to turn off the fucking fucking telly with the squad. <laughs> what in his van? He was in his van. He was blaring away. And he's just BB King's going. Goddamn. <laughs> just like we do. <laughs> Not like, not like when you and me interviewed RK Fire oh, oh, at the Reading Festival. God's sake, Bart! In, when Bart was in the book. Oh, when he, yeah, I'll give you Bart. He's nice. Uh, but we <laughs> sure didn't, when was this? Two, that was 2011 as well. 2011. Was for me. And 11. And it was, that was probably the worst interview we've done together. Well, because I turned up uh, on site, he was already there, a consummate professional. He'd done about four or five interviews already. I was about four ciders down. <laughs> and he goes, um, we're going to be interviewing RK Fire in ten minutes. I said, yes, are you going to be interviewed? <laughs> he said, no, we're doing it. I said, I've had four pints, mate. <laughs> I said, well, it, dutifully, I went in and we sat next to each other. And it was when the suburbs had just come out, wasn't yeah. it? And uh, Matt's asking all kinds of very dark questions, interesting questions, illuminating questions, and answers coming out. And he says, when I squeeze your leg, I want you to ask a question. And he says, squeeze my leg, and my mind was completely blank. <laughs> so I just went. Have you ever seen Terry and Jim? Was <laughs> <laughs> there, there my life? <laughs> Suburbs was supposed to be, yeah, yeah. That was that was pre BBC. That was not. We do not. That, would, that wouldn't have been on the watch of the those on the beat. Um, okay. Um, now, just quickly, we're going to ask some questions. Uh, see if there are any questions amongst you guys.